Thanks for joining us today with Caldwell Cooks. I'm Chef Corey Hooks here at Caldwell Community College and Technical Institute uh, here in the culinary department. Today, we're gonna do one of my favorites, which is chili. Now, chili can be done many different ways. This is one of my favorite ways to do it. It's also one of my favorite ways to use up deer shoulder. Um, I have quite a few avid hunters in my family, so this it's a great way to use up venison. Um, and it's probably my favorite way to use deer shoulder instead of always grinding or making sausage with it. So first, we're gonna start with the meat. Now this right here is a ground chuck. Notice it's in a whole roast. You know, if you don't have the time or you don't wanna do the actual knife cuts or the meat fabrication, you can buy stew meat, it's totally fine. You can buy bison, elk. This, this dish will work with a lot of different proteins, but I love using chuck, mainly for the fat content and I don't like using ground meat for my chili. There's different uh, uh, uses for that ground meat with chili, burgers, hot dogs, etc. But I love using um, a chuck roast to get that texture and it's got way more flavor than a ground beef. So let's go ahead and get started on the chuck roast and I'll show you how to break this down. There's not too much you need to take off except a little bit of extra fat. That's the main thing we're gonna look at and we don't want to take all the fat, right? We need some fat. We need to keep some fat on there. But you can see the marble all the way through the chuck. Okay, so these hard pieces is what we're going to try to get to. And simply following the seam is the easiest way to break this down. So we're just going to follow that seam all the way down. All the way down. So that's one lobe taken off. Okay. Separated that. So now we're going to take this lobe off. Take a knife down. Just follow that seam out. It's going to open up. You can also take your fingers and try to spread while you're doing it. Help peel it right off. All right, so I've exposed some of this tough fat. Okay, so what we're going to do is just take our knife right underneath, take some of this tough fat out, okay? The harder the fat feels, the thicker it is. So if you have real hard fat, or you can feel it don't have much resistance, it's pretty thick. So that's a pretty thick piece of fat. We're going to take that out. Notice all of it's not coming off. That's fine. It's going to melt during the cooking process. One reason I love chili is the versatility, right? You can use it for many different applications. The ultimate chili dog, the ultimate cheeseburger. Goes great on mac and cheese, a good bowl of rice. So I love the versatility. You could add some fennel seed and turn it into a ragu. All right. So that piece looks nice. There's still some fat, which is okay, like I said. This is around two and a half to three pounds, which is what this recipe is going to call for. And try to get some of this silver skin off. All right. So we still got one tough piece right here we're going to try to clean out, okay? So I'm going to stand it up and work my knife right down that lobe, just like that. Now I've got my fat exposed. Take it right off. Another reason why I like using a stew meat or cubed meat, if you will, um, it's the flavor, right? You get a lot deeper, rich beef flavor whoop, with stew meat versus a ground beef. So right now we're just gonna do about an inch dice. That's all you need. You can still clean up some of these smaller pieces if you need to. Think about biting into a short rib versus a hamburger, 
right? That deep beef flavor versus that ground beef in a burger. Granted, I love a good burger, but we're talking about the flavor and the richness. And that's one reason why I love using a whole muscle versus a ground meat. Same when it comes to uh, venison as well. I would rather use deer shoulder versus ground uh, meat for my chili. One of my favorite dishes to cook on the campground when my, me and my friends are fishing, because this is an all day cook time. We're looking at three to four hours cook time on this chili. And that's gonna help all these flavors just build, build, and build. That's how I just keep working my way down. One inch dice, that's all we're looking for. All right. So we did clean a little fat. Muscle weighs more than fat. So if we started around two and a half, three pounds of meat, we're still gonna have over two pounds here for this recipe. Now, we're gonna start searing, okay? Now, what's crucial when we sear, the most important thing is to make sure you preheat, okay? And we call that conditioning our pan. So we're gonna go ahead and preheat our Dutch oven here. And we don't wanna overcrowd, okay? Never, never, never want to overcrowd. We're going to season simply with some salt and pepper. This is a seasoning blend I have, salt and pepper blend. I use a one part black pepper to five parts kosher salt. You can make a simple blend um, that you can keep on the counter, use it for a variety of different things. That way I don't have to pick up salt and pepper every time I season. Okay, we want to season this pretty well. So I keep one hand clean, one hand dirty. All right, so we're getting some heat on our Dutch oven now. So what do I mean by don't overcrowd? You might have to sear all this in batches, okay? You might have to do two batches, you might have to do three. Depends on the size of your Dutch oven and how much surface area you have in the bottom of your pan but the key is not to overcrowd. If you overcrowd, you're not gonna caramelize that meat, you're gonna steam it. It's gonna turn all gray instead of nice golden brown on the outside, okay? So the key here is caramelization. Caramelization is where the flavor's gonna be, and that's how you're gonna build some depth with this chili, okay? So we're gonna put a touch of canola oil in the bottom. We can always add, plus we're gonna have some fat uh, from the meat here. I'm gonna give this a minute to get a little bit warmer. So like I said, this is a three to four hour cook time, really depending on the size of the meat and how much you have in the pot and how hot you have your oven. So that's why I love putting this on early day, spending the time fishing or having fun with the family. It's great for cookouts. And then you come back and you can enjoy it. Like I said, you can use this for a number of different applications whether it's just to eat with a bowl of rice, beautiful cornbread, put it on top of a burger, or the ultimate chili mac. Sear in batches. So it looks like I'm gonna do two, maybe three batches. Control your heat, okay? Cooking is all about time and temperature. Right? Time and temperature. Controlling the temperature and controlling how long that product stays at that temperature, right? So that's really the main two things that we can manipulate and control during the cooking process. All right, good going brown on both sides is what we're looking for. What we're doing is we're building a bond on the bottom of this pot, right? all those great sticky bits that stick to the bottom of the pan. That's what we call a fawn. That's gonna build a great base for our chili, right? That's where the flavor's gonna start. 
So what we're doing here is building layers of flavor. Okay, we got the protein, we're gonna add some aromatics, some spices, some herbs. Building layers of flavor. Give that a minute just to caramelize. You notice you reach your smoke point, you can turn it down just a little bit. Great thing about Dutch ovens and cast iron, they hold their heat well and they sear very well. Thinner pans tend to burn. Oh yeah, beautiful color. Beautiful color. If your meat's still sticking, that does not mean you don't have enough oil in there. It means your uh, protein hasn't caramelized fully yet. So if it's still sticking, wait a minute, okay? Once it releases, um, that means it's caramelized and it's ready to go. Same with a grill, saute pan. If your protein keeps keep sticking, that means your pan wasn't hot enough, we didn't preheat correctly, or your protein hasn't fully caramelized yet, so it's not releasing from the pan. All right, we're just caramelizing both sides here. That's all we're doing, okay? So don't get carried away. Caramelizing both sides, we're gonna take it back out of the pot. We're not cooking fully. Okay, so if you see some pink meat, some red meat, that's totally fine. Remember I told you this is gonna be a three to four minute cook time, or excuse me, three to four hour cook time. So we're gonna finish that cooking process, okay? You might need to adjust your fat. We might have to add a little bit more canola oil and that's fine, you can. Let's go in with our second batch. You could actually cut this down a little smaller if you only wanted an hour and a half or two hour cook time. The larger the cut, the better caramelization, caramelization you're gonna have, excuse me. We about lost a piece. Yeah, let's do three batches. So we're gonna do three batches on this one. All right, we're looking for good color. I'm gonna add a touch more canola oil. We're getting a little dry. So this is technically a stewing technique. We call this a stewing technique. What does that mean? That means it's tough cuts, cooked for a long period of time in some kind of liquid, right? So any kind of stewing technique, you start out with your protein to build that fond on the bottom of your pan, which is what we're doing now. You move then to your aromatics, which is gonna be your peppers and onions and carrots and celery, garlic. Then we're gonna deglaze with some red wine, add some beautiful beef stock, add our meat back and let that cook. Beautiful color. All right. Start going in with our final batch. If you get to three batches, that's probably going to be your maximum before your fawn starts to burn, okay? Remember, we still have a fawn from the first batch. So if we get over three batches, you might have to use two separate pans or you're going to need a bigger Dutch oven, okay? You don't have to use a Dutch oven for this. You can use what we call a rondo, which is a large pan, short-sided, about this big. It's kind of like a Dutch oven, but just a little shorter. You can use a rondo if you want to. A large saute pan will work. You can build everything in a saute pan and then put it in a baking dish, cover it, bake it in the oven if you don't have a Dutch oven. Gonna add a touch more fat. 
Now, what do you think's happening to my fat as I'm cooking? And why do I have to keep adding fat? The meat's not absorbing it, right? It's evaporating. So that's why we're having to add fat um, here and there. It's turning into a vapor and it's evaporating. All right, beautiful color. Our fawn's still not burning yet. So we're gonna try to get this caramelized. Get these flipped over. Beautiful. All right, now we're ready. We have color on both sides. Beautiful fond in the bottom of the pan. Time to move on to our next step. Now it's time to start building our dish. All right, so aromatics are next, okay? What do I mean by aromatics? Any kind of vegetable will qualify for an aromatic. So for this dish, we're using peppers, onions, garlic. We're going to add some tomato as well. This is optional, right? As long as you stay true to the technique and knowing when to add these aromatics, the recipe can change. And that's what I tell my students. Stay true to the technique. If you don't like green bell peppers, take them out. Put red bell peppers. If you want to add carrot, add carrot. If you want to add olives, add olives. Like I said, one thing you could add would be fennel seed, right? That could kind of turn it into that Italian ragu flavor profile. Leave some of the cumin out and add some fennel seed. You could use it over pasta. All right, we're starting to get some nice color. We don't want to burn, okay? The fond on the bottom of this pan is gonna start turning your aromatics, which is perfectly fine. Now let's go with our garlic. I always tend to add my garlic towards the end of my aromatic process so I don't burn, okay? The knife cuts on my peppers and onions are a lot larger than the garlic, so I don't want it to burn. Once you start smelling that garlic, you can go ahead and add your tomato paste. Say about a tablespoon. We started out with a cup of bell pepper, cup of onion, tablespoon of garlic. And that's subjective. You can add more garlic if you like garlic. About a tablespoon of tomato paste. Now what this tomato paste is gonna do is it's gonna caramelize on the bottom of the pan as well. It's gonna add a lot of depth to this dish. I love using tomato paste because a little goes a long way. It can, it can really add a lot of depth to your dish. So we're gonna let that caramelize for a minute. We're gonna let that cook, okay? Let's let this cook. Let's talk about our spice mix here. So we have ground cumin, ground coriander, chili powder, cayenne pepper, and oregano, dried oregano. And what I like to do is go ahead and add this to my aromatics, okay? Now, if you don't like it as spicy, you can leave the cayenne pepper out. Notice I didn't use any hot chilies. That's something else you can add to the dish, okay? If you wanna take some of the cayenne out and you like the flavor of the chili, add a jalapeno, right? Add a serrano, add an Anaheim pepper. Totally subjective. Just make sure you add it during the right step. Now we're starting to caramelize. It's looking real good. All right, so now I'm gonna to toast my cumin, my chili pepper, 
or powder, and our coriander. Love, love, love coriander. Coriander is what cilantro is, right? It's what cilantro is before it grows into the plant. Coriander seed is cilantro. It's got a different flavor. It's very, very aromatic. So I love toasting these spices first, okay? Tomato goes in. Deglaze with the red wine. What does deglazing do? Deglazing is going to lift all that fond off the bottom of the pan. So all that flavor we built the first three, four steps of this process is getting lifted off the bottom of this pan, is getting introduced to, or not introduced, but it's getting incorporated into the dish. You can smell those toasted spices. I love adding that cumin and coriander first, getting it real nice and toasty before we deglaze. Just adds a different element of flavor to the dish. All right, we're gonna reduce this wine by half. So you can turn your heat up. Notice I didn't add my cayenne, my oregano. Don't want those to burn. Don't want that cayenne to get too hot. So once this reduces by half, we're gonna add our oregano, our cayenne. We'll add a touch of seasoning, a little bit of salt and pepper, okay? Smells great already. Now we added chopped tomatoes with the juice. It's about a cup. You could use crushed. Okay, you don't have to use chopped. You can do half and half. I like the texture and the visualization of the, the chopped tomatoes. But you can use crushed if you'd rather use crushed. Um, you can use uh, vegetable juice if you'd rather do that. That would add a nice element, some more depth and flavor to the dish as well. All right, that's looking great. At this point, I'll add a touch of seasoning. In with my oregano. In with my cayenne. That was a teaspoon of each. Okay, guys? A teaspoon of each. We had a teaspoon of coriander, a teaspoon of cumin, oregano, chili powder, and cayenne. Don't confuse that with tablespoon. You will have a spicy chili. All right, you can see how a lot of that liquid's been evaporated. So that means we're reduced by half, if not more. Now I'm gonna go in with some beef stock. About a cup and a half to two cups of beef stock. Okay, I'm gonna reserve some, bring this up to temp, and we'll start adding our protein back. Like I said, a lot of these ingredients can be substituted. The, the ingredients are not as important as the actual technique in building the chili itself, okay? That goes for any recipe. All right. Always add hot liquids to hot dishes, okay? So make sure that stock is nice and hot. You don't want to add cold stock to a hot dish. It's going to shock it, take it three or four times as long to heat back up. So gently add your protein back to the dish. Beautiful. Stir. It looks full. I know it does. This meat will break down, I promise. I'm going to add the rest of that stock. We do need it all. Beautiful. Bring us to a good hard simmer. it's well incorporated.
touch of seasoning before we go in the oven. Make sure your oven's preheated at 300, okay? If you want to cut that cook time down, uh, you can cut the pieces smaller, the pieces of meat smaller, and bake it at 350 for about an hour and a half, okay? You can still cook this on the stove top as well. It tends to scorch on the bottom. You have to stir it more often, so you've got to be careful and you've got to give it more love, but you can do it on the stove top. Um, I love putting it in the oven because it's set it, forget it. You can come back in three hours and it's going to be perfect, okay? We're at a good hard simmer. We're going to cover it. Go ahead and turn your heat off. We're going to go into a 300 degree oven for three to four hours, okay? We're going to check it first around three hours and see if it needs that extra hour, okay? Very hot. All right, now that we have our chili in the oven, let's talk about a great condiment that I love to use. It's something a little different. Um, smoked sour cream, okay? I love using sour cream in general. It helps balance out the heat, obviously. This is a different play uh, on sour cream, and I love using this little tool. It's a smoke gun. We use it for fruits, vegetables, uh, creams. I've actually done a smoke creme brulee before, smoking our cream with our smoke gun and then making our creme brulees. So it's a very use, versatile tool. You can find them almost anywhere online. Amazon has some good deals on different varieties of smoke guns. And there's about six different flavored chips you can get. Uh, Alderwood, Applewood, Cherrywood. We're actually using Hickory today because that's my favorite. And that's plentiful to the area. Um, so what I like to do, let's talk about the sour cream first. Get your sour cream. Try to run it around the outside of the bowl to give you more surface area as much as you can. It'll start falling back down towards the middle, but you get the idea. We're gonna cover it with plastic wrap. Just leave one side open, one little hole. That's where we're gonna put our smoke in. This hose has got a mind of its own. Now I'm gonna turn it on. It's gonna take not much at all, okay? Got our wood chips in the top. Turn it on. I'll go ahead and show you the smoke coming out. Smoke our bowl. Turn it off. Now, we're gonna try to trap that smoke in as tight as possible. Make sure you do this under a hood vent if you can. If not, do it outside so you don't set off the smoke alarm. All right, so we're gonna let that smoke for at least 15 minutes, okay? You can do it again if you want more smoke flavor. You can cut the time in half if you don't wanna do it as long. Um, so it's really up to you how long you want that smoke and how much smoke flavor you want on that sour cream, but it's gonna pair real nice with that chili, especially if you're doing venison or some kind of game meat. Pairs very, very well with that. So while that's smoking, let's check our chili. We're about the three hour mark, three and a half hour mark. So let's put our eyeballs on the chili and see how it looks. It smells great. All right, yes. That looks great. Now, one thing I want you to pay attention to is that we still have nice large chunks of meat. Each time we stir, it's going to break down and break down and break down even more. So you can tell this chili is definitely done. The meat is very, very tender. If you do this a day ahead, it's going to be even better. Okay? So you can do this a day ahead, cool it down, then reheat it the next day. It's going to be amazing. Look how this meat's just breaking down each time I stir it. It's amazing. I love it. See how hearty it is. Nice side of rice. I mean, that's a meal. Great on a cold fall day, a winter day. If you don't want to sit there and stir, good old potato masher, okay? Just to kind of break your meat up just a little bit.
Now, could you imagine a big spoonful of this on a hot dog or a hamburger? Now, can you add beans? Yes, you can. I would add more stock if you're going to add beans to this dish, but you can add beans and turn it into chili beans as well. If you're going to use dry reconstituted beans, you can add it before you put it in the oven. If you're going to use canned beans, I would pull the chili out an hour early, add the beans, fold them in, and put them back in, okay, because you don't want those beans to overcook. But I love using red kidney beans, black beans. I've used lima beans before. Um, so you can definitely add beans to the dish as well. So now you can see that meat's all broken down. It smells so good. So good. All right. Let's grab a bowl. Imagine a nice side of cornbread, maybe a big bowl of mac and cheese. Or just keep it simple. Nice rice, puffed rice maybe. All right, so let's bring the sour cream over. The smoke has dissipated a little bit, but you can see it's still smoky. It's not a hot smoke either, it's a cold smoke, okay? So you don't have to worry about the heat. Cold smoking, it takes a little bit more for that smoke to penetrate versus hot smoking. But it is definitely there. And you can actually see a little bit of the color change from that smoke. I don't know if you can see it on camera that well, but there is some color change there, and that's from the smoke. Oh yeah, it definitely penetrated. Just going to incorporate it all in because we had it spread out to give us more surface area. All right, nice dollop, smoked sour cream. You can put it in a squeeze bottle and do a nice drizzle if you wanted to. Then we have some beautiful scallion we cut on a hard bias. Stand it up, give us some nice height. Some good color there. And there you have it. A beautiful chili, smoked sour cream, scallion for garnish. Thanks for being here, Caldwell Community College Technical Institute Culinary Department. This is Caldwell Cooks. Please join us next time.